started uh, i'm very happy to introduce um, dr shankar vishwanathan uh, he is a um, um, uh, associate professor from uh, albert einstein uh, college of medicine uh, new york uh, he graduated from uh, christian medical college bangalore he did his post graduation he was a very active student and he was a very active junior faculty member in our department those days based on his uh, publications and his uh, training activities he was awarded a research assistantship to do phd at the university of north carolina then he did his phd there and moved on to um, albert einstein college and his uh, thesis is on survival analysis wow. so now i requested him whether can he can share his uh, experience uh, simply as uh, uh, continuing edu- continuing medical education activity in statistics for uh, indian society for medical statistics participants and also clinical epidemiology um, fellows in india uh, thanks uh, shankar for uh, agreeing to do this lecture in spite of your race disease schedule thank you very much please start your lecture yeah um thank you uh, good evening to everyone there and um, it, it's a pleasure being here and thank you for a uh, nice introduction dr jaisalam and um and inviting me to give a talk on this topic uh the main idea like uh, the, the the today's talk is on uh, repeated events uh, analysis especially with a focus on survival data uh <clears throat> can you see my slide moving yes yes <clears throat> i uh, just wanted to give an outline i'm not going to go too much into theory but i thought like it would be good to introduce uh, the concepts as well as some examples uh, mostly i'm going to go through some some of the examples uh, which i have been involved with and uh, and i've been part of the uh, data collection or data analysis uh, over the years and some are uh, from my collaborations as well uh today's talk uh, i'll slowly move with most of you are uh familiar with survival analysis but it, uh, i thought like i'll just start with a introduction couple of slides on uh univariate survival model <coughs> uh then i'll move on to introduce the recurrent events um and i'll talk about uh recurrent event models especially today's focus um i'm going to do on recurrent rate models Uh, I'll explain why in a couple of slides down, more mostly on recurrent rate models. Uh, then um, I'll also talk about um, other uh, implications, not just the rate model, uh, some of the complexities when you're analyzing it and scenarios. Um, then I'll summarize it. Um, um, as uh, we know like uh, the survival analysis uh, or otherwise called failure time data analysis uh, is often ha- uh, used to model time to an event uh, with an objective uh, to estimate time to an event for a group of individuals or to compare time to an event between two or more groups and of course the common thing is like we don't stop there but we try to analyze them uh with multiple covariates especially assessing the uh risk factors uh for a certain event uh, it can be a disease or a, a type of a disease uh examples of such uh events could be time to death disease progression normally you see these kind of events in cohort studies um uh, while um i have been involved in cancer clinical trials a lot and i do see a lot of uh, events uh, such as remissions uh, overall survival progression free survival um uh, in clinical trials set up the third thing is like uh, we can also think of a uh, waiting time like time to some type of a treatment as uh, one of the uh what do you call uh um, Uh, an event time to a treatment it could be time to surgery um so i've been involved in delay in uh, delay in surgery delay in care um uh, as one of the event uh, in large uh, 
cancer cohort registry based uh, studies. So uh, time to treatment would be one such event. The common analysis, um, why do we do that survival analysis? And I'm sure I'm preaching to the crowd, like kind of, we know that it basically it allows us the third dimension and um, in addition, just not just modeling yes and no, but it allows us to add time dimension to the analysis as well as it handles censoring. Um, I think uh, over the years, like it has, uh, survival analysis has developed and to handle different type of censoring, uh, like uh, right censoring, left censoring, interval censoring. And also in terms of analysis, if you see censoring mechanisms, uh, uh, type one uh, sensory mechanism, mechanism where you have in the, the type one, uh, basically uh, you're, you're modeling uh, the time to certain number of calendar time. While in the type two, you're modeling like uh, up to a certain number of events, then you truncate everybody. Like you, you censor everyone. So number of total number of events. If you have hundred subjects, if you, if your study, you say that you have 30 parties, 30 events, if you need, then after 30 events, you are going to stop the study. So that's the thing. And the methods commonly used, uh, we know that uh, descriptives are couple and mayor, product limit estimators, um, we use log rank test for comparison. If, if you are, are a Wilcoxon test uh, as hypothesis testing. And of course, uh, parametric models and semi-parametric model, um, which is the most common uh, model, which is used under survival analysis with a proportional hazard assumption. So these are common methods and we know. So in today's talk, I'm going to switch gears and say, introduce recurrent events. Um, so what are those? So if our interest is not just time to an event, one event, or the first event, time to first event, but we have the subject's experience more than one, more than one event repeatedly, uh, then that is of interest, then that, produces recurrent events, okay? So subjects may experience such kind of events uh, in many scenarios. So ex um, examples would be uh, repeated transient is ischemic attacks among people, um, repeated hospital uh, hospitalization due to asthma attacks um, or repeated falls. Uh, so in today's talk, I'm gonna use three of these, three or four, um, uh, like uh, repeated falls among elderly, which is a common problem, uh, especially when they are given for their old age or for the pain, they are taking a lot of medication, uh, which can uh, have issues. And of course, uh, you can also think uh, repeated infections. So when we say repeated, when we say um, uh, recurrent, um, it can like the main thing which we think of is like uh, the patient has to be alive or a, a participant has to be alive depending upon the type of event you use and it is not terminal. Okay, so that, that, that's the main criteria. I'm going to introduce a study which I involved in, um, uh, maybe 15 years ago and, uh, um, and we published a paper. It's a randomized control trial um, this study is about what I, for this presentation, I call it as a false study. It's a randomized control trial uh, for preventing falls through enhanced pharm pharmacologic care. Uh, the main uh, goal was to assess the effects of community-based uh, pharmacies to prevent falls uh, targeting high-risk gold. Uh, uh, adults. So the patients were, our uh, participants were recruited from the community pharmacy chain uh, in North and South Carolina in the US. Um, the eligibility criteria was like uh, the pay, uh, participant has to be 65 years or older who had at least fallen once during their last 12 month period uh, before the study enrollment. And uh, taking medication associated with risk 
uh, increased risk of falls. Uh, medication, uh, what type of medication if you have, it can be barbiturates or something make dizziness like kind of, so painkillers which can, uh, benzos and other things. So a total of 186 adults participated in the study, okay? So to give an idea, so this is a calendar even chart, okay? So um, the chart is produced using R. So uh, basically you can see uh, when, when the study was started, it's 2005, we started October 1st. Uh, the study ended somewhere around um, August of, uh, end of August of, uh, the follow-up ended in end of August uh, in 2008. Uh, the, the first follow-up, the red dots depict the first uh, follow-up, basically, uh, the, when they get the intervention, and the green dots are the last to follow up when the study got truncated, okay, or they, they lost a follow up for over a period of time. And the black ones are the number of faults. So you can see that quite a number of people having many falls, okay. Uh, this is divided into intervention and a control group. The control group where you don't give any intervention uh, while the intervention was. Uh, the community pharmacy pharmacist went through the, uh, what do you call uh, the prescription where they get prescriptions and see uh, if they can reduce the number of uh, medications which may cause uh, uh, like dizziness or the, if there are overlap of medications that can be re reduced in collaboration with their primary physicians. So that was the intervention. Okay. Uh, I'll stop. So that wasn't that. That's an example. I'll use the same example for an analysis um, layer, and also give another uh, re repeated events within the same study um, soon. <clears throat> the commonly in recurrent events, when you say uh, there are many models proposed, uh, they can be they can be grouped into two type of models, like uh, one is hazard or intensity models. Um, so some of them are Anderson Gill model, familiar, like a lot of reviews have been done over the years, like uh, comparing these models, a lot of thesis has been written. Um, Anderson Gill, the first of the model which came was Prentice William Peterson model, um, whom proposed a conditional model by uh, providing stratified proportional intensities or uh, uh, with time dependence trade and those models. Uh, then subsequently in 82, Anderson Gill model provide a extended Cox type model. Uh, usually uh, you see this and uh, of course, uh, Vail and Westfeld uh, proposed in uh, 89, uh, uh, hazard type model, Cox hazard type model. Then other models include um, Allen, uh, 84, and uh, McKeag and Sassini. They extended this Allen's model to incorporate both uh, what do you call time-dependent coefficients as well as um, time-dependent, like time-invariant um, covariates to be in the model. So I said when I started the presentation that I'm going to focus more on mean and rate models. Um, the first of the such model that the hazard and intensity models, basically uh, what we do in the in hazard and intensity is most of these model uh, try to capture the uh, association um, through the history of the covariates and a proper history needs to be done, modeled. And uh, they are modeled through a uh, Poisson or a count or a renewal process, which are, which are usually uh, attractive to model recurrent events, but uh, Anderson Gill and Prentice William Peterson models, normally the renew based on Poisson and renewal um, uh, processes, um, they don't describe the recurrent event sequence sufficiently. That's the problem with those models, okay? So, and the other issue is if the objective is to assess the effect of covariate 
covariates on the processes, the recurrent event processes, the analysis of marginal distribution is suggested. Okay, so you want to get a marginal distribution type models, uh, especially when you want to avoid the intrasubject dependent structure. If you don't like the, so usually, so, so if given that is the scenario, a marginal mean and rates model uh, are a better model because they are marginal, more marginal, and these are conditional models. Okay, so that's why I wanted to talk today um, more on the mean and rates model. So the a lot of uh, like Pepe and Kai was the first one long uh, to propose a, a mean and rate model where uh, they presented like uh, uh, the the rate is presented as like average of the intensities basically. Um, then, uh, of course, there are other models. Lin Wei, Ying and Yang, Yang, Yang and Ying presented the theoretical framework for it based on, because there is no Martingale theory for it. So they presented uh, uh, based on the strong theoretical framework for these rate models under empirical process theory. Uh, and these models have been extended further uh, the, for additive models by Lin and Ying. And of course, um, you have um, Shubal and Kai um, and Zheng, they have presented a lot of additive models as well. Um, so I want to give a justification or convince like, so what's the difference between the intensity model and rate model? The intensity models basically need all the models, what uh, the Anderson-Gill model or uh, prentice william peterson model need to specify rich covariate set um, so that it catches what happened in the history. So it has to have, so normally the history uh, in practical sense, normally what we do is how many events had occurred before. Okay, so we normally model them uh, there are many ways to model the history. There is no way to check how you are, which type of history you put in the model is best. There is no way. And also the good performance of the estimates produced through those models depends upon those accurate specification, what type of covariate sets you are putting in. Okay, so which is very difficult in a practical sense. Like you can, you can, you can, you can model the history. So if you have an, uh, if you have an uh, what you call um, events, recurrent events for somebody, zero, one, two, three, you can you can do a recurrent event. So you can somebody having the first event. So the, here is zero. They have first event one one one. So a person A, they have an event. So they have so they have the first event here, second event here, third event here. So basically, you're capturing the history, right? So. So you can, history can be captured by recurrent events like this, or even you can put it recurrent event square, or you can put it as a dummy variable. So you can put model as like uh, somebody having history, one, one fall, the fall example, if you take somebody having one fall, two fall, or three plus falls, you can do that. Uh, but there is no way to check whether which type of model helps the best estimates. Uh, furthermore, um, the problem, or I wouldn't call it a problem, the issue with the intensity models are the parameters are interpreted conditionally. It's conditioned on the history. It's like how we are trying to conditioning on the history or in terms of uh, uh, PWP models, the Prentice William Peterson models, it's like kind of you're, you're having uh, uh, time dependent strain. So that, that, that's why the intensity models, these are the issues. On the other hand, I wanted to point out the rate models. The rate models are defined only in terms of covariate alone. No history is needed. Just like you throw in the covariates and it's assumed like, and it's marginal. Mostly the rate function is more marginal in the, in the sense that the history is not considered at all. So it's much more interpretable. It has an improved interpretation of the regression parameter, um, but it has 
it's at the expense may like basically we don't have a martingale theory it's based on an empirical process theory the justification is so but it's a trade-off right so rate models are interpretable very straightforward you are talking in terms of instead of hazard you are talking in terms of rate and it's directly modelable So I'm going to list this basically Anderson Gill model uh, is, uh, is an extended Cox type model uh, to handle. It's basically a Cox model. You can say only thing is now you have an extra sub, um, subscripts like basically for each event. So extended to a multiple event data intensity for the kth recurrence event is basically you're giving like a Cox model. And it uses the Cox uh, function, like score function, to estimate the parameter estimate. Uh, all of the models today we talk, there is no specific correlation structure we, we consider, uh, but we adjust those two by using a robust variance estimator. Okay, so that's how we adjust the correlations to get the inference part. Similarly, the Prentice William Peterson is just this involves it's a, it's a conditional model, as I said before. Uh, it, it is like a Cox model, uh, but it allows what do you call um, it, it is based on a time dependent strata, stratified proportional intensity models. Okay, so basically. Uh, the difference, like you can, you can, it allows the Prentice William Peterson model allows you to get even specific. Okay, the the difference between like uh, in the Anderson Gill model, you don't get even specific estimates. Normally, it is used uh, when the interest is overall reference rate. Um, so you, you're modeling one, but the Prentice William Peterson will allow you to model even specific. Uh, I would say even specific rates, uh, even specific coefficients, uh, you can get, so that's that one. And Cox type is, a co uh, the valen westfeld model is also a Cox type proportional hazards model, but it assumes a marginal structure. Uh, it is well developed theoretically, and it gives you a population average covariate effects. Uh, but the problem is, uh, the lambda for the it has its own issues because uh, you consider in the well well in Westfield model is like you you are considering a risk for k plus one event when somebody did not have k events so you are you are logistically it's so not logistically logically it is pop uh, it has inconsistency okay it has a deficiency on uh, basically you are thinking that a subject's having who did not have one fall or two fall, you're talking about them having eighth fall. So that does not make, make sense. So these are some of the flaws in this. So now I'll switch to race model and uh, mostly uh, I will stop the equations uh, in the next slide, then we'll go to an example and see, go and interpret it and what are the other issues as uh, I present more. Uh, you will see the complexities. Um, the model for recurrent events on the, the rates, um, uh, here I present the proportional rates model, where this is the, the rate function. Normally, it is estimated uh, similar. Only thing is it doesn't consider history. Okay, it just only consider this is the counting process. Basically, Ni star is the counting of an event and uh, Z is the covariance basically. Uh, so this can be written, it, it's exactly similar to the function form of uh, the Cox model, right? So, but only thing is that now the intensity or a hazard function is replaced by a rate function, okay? What does that mean in practical sense? So, Everything is pretty much the same. Only thing is we don't have a history form. So given the scenario, you can use uh, available software to run these models. 
if you run without a history, we are able. Uh, Anderson, with, so if you think about if you the score function, you can trick if you don't add the covariate uh, history in the, uh, as a co as a covariate in the model. Basically, you arrive at proportional rates more. Okay, there are justification. The other model is like uh, additive rate model. Uh, additive rate models are basically used um, if you are interested in, if your interest of effect measure is not rate ratio, but more absolute measure rate difference. Okay, so it's like a linear regression one. So you have an intercept you have here. The intercept is basically a rate function and you have the regression coefficient. Uh, this model is a semi-parametric additive rate model. So I just put it in here to show you that this is a combination of uh, what do you call uh, additive rate model with time varying covariates. Either this is the time varying coefficients. Basically uh, your coefficients are varying over time. It's here you have time in varying coefficients. So this is an so this is a combination where it's a it's a combination of a non-parametric modeling like a spline type modeling, or uh, like your your coefficients are varying over time, cumulative coefficients, while the other one is like a regular how we interpret uh, in our reg regressions like you get estimates for the theta, theta naughts are uh, uh, estimates for each of those covariates, which are not time variant, okay? So, uh, I'll st from now on, I'll give you an interpretation. How do we interpret between the multiplicative and uh, additive models? Uh, let's consider an the example, the recurrent event, what we are interested in is hospitalization, uh, repeated hospitalization for children with asthma, or it can be repeated hospitalization of uh, elderly due to fall, okay? And we have two covariates, uh, ZOI, ZI1, which is the treatment. So let's consider binary, okay? Uh, intervention and a control and ZI2 is the age variable. So if you fit a multiplicative and additive models that will look like one and two, where this is the treatment indicator variable and this is the age. Um, so the interpretation usually you do is, uh, beta one gives, that is this one, gives the rate ratio for hospitalization comparing treatment to placebo group adjusting for age while theta one gives you the rate difference for hospitalization for comparing the treatment to placebo group. So, so basically it's like uh, how we do the regression interpretation. Okay. Um, one other interpretation you can think about is uh, it's a cumulative. So this is a rate function, but, the, but sometimes what the investigator might be interested in presenting a age adjusted number of hospitalization. Instead of saying just two fold increase or exact number of increase per one, we, they want to know number of hospitalization. How do we estimate the number of hospitalization between zero to two years or zero to one year? That can be achieved basically when you have a cumulative rate function that becomes a mean function under external covariates, like external time-dependent covariate scenario, then uh, what happens is like kind of uh, your, uh, when you calculate the, the, the mean function, it gives you the, the total number of age adjusted hospitalization uh, by this formula. Basically you're taking the cumulative rate functions and if you multiply them with that function of uh, this, that will give you the age adjusted change in uh, number of hospitalization for the interval zero to T1. So there are two interpretations we do. So I'll, I'll show these with an example, um, which I've, I've been involved, which I was involved um, uh, over the years uh, 
Okay. Uh, let's uh, move from now on. Most of them are, I will explain the models and a, a little bit, but I will mostly talk about uh, examples of these faults. Uh, um, examples uh, for each of the scenarios or the type of models what we use. So as I mentioned, um, uh, for the first set of uh, the example one, what I'm going to use is called the elderly fall study. Uh, it, it is the study was interested in preventing falls through enhanced pharmacological care, uh, which was a randomized control trial. So. These are participants. Uh, participants were recruited at a, a chain uh, of pharmacies, like a curl drug, or there are certain chain phar pharmacy chains there. Uh, so they were recruited there, um, mainly um, in two states. Um, uh, the I mentioned before the participant inclusion criteria had to they had to had a fall. They are taking at least a couple of uh, medications which are associated with uh, increased risk of falls. Okay, so we published this one in uh, 2010. So I showed a calendar event, calendar event chart before, um, like how the calendar years, but uh, we enroll these subjects, but the analysis way, if you look at it, if you streamline, pull everybody to zeroth time, when they were time of randomization, if you look at it, uh, so it's streamlined. So we eliminated them, even though some of them were early part of the pilot study, the analysis include from the starting point zero, okay? And we monitored them. So there are two groups, intervention group and uh, control group. Basically, uh, times, uh, and you can see the number number of falls, which how, how many were. You can see a couple of them had many falls, okay, or, or the follow up period, like uh, over a one and a half year. If it, this is the number number days, you can see number of uh, number of falls. We even within a year they had multiple falls. Okay, uh, so the intervention was basically. Uh, uh, they were invited to participate in a face-to-face -face medication consultation by the community pharmacy res uh, residents. The controls where we didn't do any anything. So we they will come, fill up the prescription, they'll go back. We just measure their uh, number of falls, uh, rec recurrent falls, I would say. And the covariates, what we considered was uh, intervention, age, gender, uh, how many we categorize dummy like we categorize them number of falls uh, in the previous year like that's the inclusion criteria like somebody had a fall they are more likely to have we didn't this is not a history it's more to see before when they came in did they have multiple falls we wanted to see it's we are not seeing we are not modeling the thing number of high risk conditions this could be like a vision problem other problems. Um, we also calculated uh, whether they use CAIN or not. And this is the model which we fit. So here is a, a table. So two set of analysis we performed for the rate models. Basically one is an intention to treat, how they, um, like a, uh, how they were randomized. Uh, and there were some people who switched. So we, we also did a we also did a, a as treated analysis and you can see the main interest was the intervention so this one so the intention to treat uh, the the rate the in the intervention provides a four percent decrease in the recurrent falls while when we did the as treated, how, how they were given, it showed the intervention showed uh, uh, 24%. So you can see the interpretation is straightforward. It's not like condition on how they fell, whether they had within the study, whether they had two falls or three falls, it's not conditional interpretation, it's straightforward. And uh, 
how you, one practical thing you, you can ask is like how you fit this model. It's basically you can use any regular uh, statistical software, uh, Stata, R, and uh, uh, SAS, whichever you are comfortable with. And it's straightforward and you just throw in like a, you run a Cox model uh, with a robust variance uh, that should provide you the results. So that's the rate part. Uh, here is a cumulative uh, uh, mean or the number of, uh, 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 what is called estimated number of falls for the group who had no intervention. So you can see on an average, they had two to 2.5 over a one year, one and a half year, one year period. Uh, say whose age is 75 years, who are females. Uh, this is all the reference category. So as the days increases, they, are, they have an average number of falls is about two to two and 2.5 falls. So that gives an assumption. Uh, I am going to present the rates model also here. Uh, here, the only change is instead of saying, instead of a uh, multiplicative effect, I wanted to show you that uh, there are models which are available to use uh, when your interest is a uh, rate uh, difference. Okay, uh, so so we'll be using the, for this, uh, I'm, I what I tried to use was to, as an example, um, the idea was to assess the effects of community pharmacy intervention uh, on high risk medication filling. Okay, when I say high risk, they they are um, uh, they they go and fill more than five prescription, which can have an overlap. Okay, one contraindication, one medication to another, which can make them more dizzy. How often they fill? But they are pain medication. They are falling down and they can have an injury. So the, the doctor prescribes them pain medication without knowing they went for another complication they can be given. So they can have an additional impact, okay? The high risk uh, medications included uh, benzodiazepine, antidepressant, anticonvulsant, sedative. There are a lot of them. So these elderly people were filling up it's not that they were prescribed a lot of medication uh, uh, which are like which which are more uh, which provides more risk for falls as well so in, here i'm showing you i'm filling fitting a allen's um, uh, additive rate model so it's like a linear regression only thing is now your time uh, when you're fitting a linear regression you have a y you uh, for the additive rates model, you will fit like uh, uh, how you would do, uh, you have a bi bivariate distribution, uh, time for uh, event as well as uh, time for censoring and uh, censoring status is there. So it's, it's also straightforward. So you throw in, uh, this can be fit using R function, like uh, I think uh, um, time reg, uh, time reg uh, library should allow you to fit these. R has a lot of functions. You can fit these models. Oops. Okay, this is a medication recurrent. You can see even more than the false, the medication filling is much more higher. Okay, so this is an interval even chart. So additive rate function, what happens is here, uh, the, basically each one of them is time varying. It's a non-parametric type model. So it doesn't provide you one coefficient at the time, but rather give you a cumulative, I'll come back to this thing, rather it will give you a cumulative regression coefficient. So how to interpret this? So when you're dealing with a time varying coefficient, uh, basically you can see the, there are two things you can see how, they are increasing or decreasing. Whether they, it also the picture allows you the cumulative regression coefficients allows you to interpret in terms of whether they are linearly increasing or 
uh, there is a nonlinear form. Say, for example, the, the gender male, uh, if you're taking the cumulative coefficient for medication filling, uh, as, the, as the up to 200 days, within the 200 days, the, this is a 90 with confidence interval, 95% confidence interval, the rate of increase, okay, you can see the rate of increase uh, is quadratic, okay, it's time varying, like it's a function. While if you look at this, uh, this is an intercept basically where the time dependent treatment was given as a much more linear function, okay, the age is increasing in a linear form. So, it allows you to interpret whether like how the coefficients as they are changing, how does it change? It will allow you to do that. Here is the output. Normally, as I said, like in additive rate model, you get the coefficient. There are a lot of coefficients estimated per time. So it's accumulated by chart, but you, you check whether they are significant using a supremum test, okay, non-significant. Here you can see the log of history of medication is significant, okay? It doesn't give you, you cannot interpret in terms of um, directly like a one, like a five, two times more, uh, the log medication is two times more, but rather it gives you uh, multiple different way to interpret it. So that's one. And the second column here will allow you to think about whether you want some variables to be time variant some variables to be time invariant. Uh, this test gives you test for time, time invariant effects. Okay, so that means uh, you see that uh, intervention, the gender, they are time invariant. So you can throw them as a regular coefficients, but you want to keep the log of uh, the medication, whatever the this one, okay, to be time varying. So you can fit only this variable, so to be having a time varying coefficient, but others you can model them as regular coefficients. So that, that is one type of additive rate model. The other one, uh, which is uh, other model, which I wanted to talk about here is additive rate model proposed by Lin and Ng, uh, which is, which doesn't involve any non-parametric estimation, but it's semi-parametric in a way that it's similar to Cox model, but directly this, this can be fit using a AA reg, I think, um, function in Cox under a certain library. You can, you can, you can fit that, it's, it's also straight. So the interpretation here, uh, if you see the additive regression for medication filling, it gives you the, the number of medication as the time dependent, like if you're looking at uh, in the intervention group, like uh, if you are, if you give a pharmacy, the number of medication filling reduces per day. Per day, uh, you have a reduction in number of medication filling uh, is um, uh, eight. And if you want to, it's, it's in very small decimals. If you want to do over 365, you multiply by 365, it gives you per year how much medication filling uh, decreased. It'll give you an idea, okay? And this gives you an estimated cumulative number of high-risk medication fillings for the similar, whatever the criteria, female patients uh, and one medication filling in during the last year, okay? <clears throat> The models, what, whatever I specified before, um, I talk, talked about uh, um, under the scenario that the censoring is uh, uh, non-informative censoring. There is no terminal event. It's under the assumption that there is no dependent, uh, non, uh, there is no dependent censoring. What I mean by it, um, there are situations where you have a terminal event which can uh, truncate your, your event of interest. So one such one, uh, example is something like a death. Okay, your, your event of interest 
is um, cancer recurrence, okay? And, uh, but if somebody died, it's like a competing risk, it died, it changes, it's informative censoring, that patient cannot get recurrent event. So you need to take into account that issue, okay? So here is an example for that, okay? So this was a study which has been published in 1977, it's a multi-center study on bladder cancer, uh, which compares placebo, uh, pyridoxin, pyridoxin, type eta for recurrence in stage one, okay? So there were 121 patients, 25% uh, experience death. So I'm just go, going to give you an uh, example here. So if you see that, this is the number of tumor recurrence. So people by each group, okay? 24%, there are 11 of them died here, 11 died. So you can ignore and ignore the death. What people mostly do is it's very, there is no standard software for it. So people normally ignore the death as a uh, censoring and uh, analyze it, but that can have Im implications on the inference, okay? That can have issues on the estimates as well. There could be bias. So there are type of models which has been proposed Again, it's an extension of a, a proportional rate models, what we saw before, uh, both additive and as well as multiplicative rates model. Um, this has been dealt by Gosh and Lin in 2002. They published papers for handling terminal event. Basically, the models of the estimating equation looks the same. So if you take the couple of slides back, if you take, you might wonder like, it looks exactly the same. What, what are we talking about? That the difference is how you deal the score equations. Like this score equation, basically they use two type of weights to handle terminal events. Uh, one is called uh, inverse probability censoring weight. The other one is called inverse probability survival weight. So I'm just showing an example here. Uh, so basically the score equation, if you don't have this one, the weight function, this is nothing but if you remove this one, okay, and these core functions don't have these weights, uh, then it is exactly, if they have the same weight as one, it is exactly same as the one which is proposed by Pepe and Kai. But this weights, what it takes care is, it takes care of the informative sensor, okay? So that's, that's what um, makes a difference in handling the analysis. So we, we use the uh, example here. Uh, so you can see here, this is the, this beta is, this is multiplicative hazard, uh, multiplicative hazard. So, so the function you can interpret in terms of, uh, you, you can take exponentiated and say rate ratio, e to the power 0 0.02 would be for each of them. So with paradox in the rate of re recurrence uh, increased, while the with thiopeta, thi, thiotepa, uh, the rate uh, of uh, recurrence of tumors decreased. Okay, so yeah. So, so one thing I wanted to stop by, it's, we are almost closer to seven. So uh, here, um, so how many more minutes do I have? So I just... Okay, um, I'll keep continuing another, I have a couple of more slides, so I'll talk about. So there is an extension, further extension is, um, sometimes your interest may be for the recurrent events, not just one type of event. Uh, the event of interest you could have is, can have uh, multiple type of in, uh, events you are interested in. Um, so examples of such type are like infections uh, in bone marrow transplantation or any transplantation, kidney transplantation, bacterial, fungal, viral infections, or uh, even within a, a particular infection, there are types of, say, for example, if you're working with HIV patients and uh, you wanted to recurrent STI uh, infections, 
or if you are dealing with high risk population, high risk uh, young population who are sexually active, they are more prone to have uh, STIs. So you can say recurrent type of STIs. So those are the situations, it's not one infection, but those are the situations where you can have, the interest is not what type of infection is coming more often. Either it is uh, bacterial infections coming up, is it viral infections coming up, or you can say, is it gonorrhea coming up more than chlamydia, or is it uh, trichomonasis coming? You can have situations where uh, your, your interest is uh, not just any infection, but more number of infections, okay? Um, other example would be physician visits, hospitalization, you can compare them. Oops. So here is a Indian renal transplant study. This is a data from CMC Velour. Um, the data was used, and uh, I have been part of a couple of publications along with Dr. J. Shilin as well. Um, uh, the, the data involved around 1355 patients from 94 to 2000. Seven, uh, these are uh, kidney transplant, renal transplant patients who are immunocompromised and they are more susceptible to opportunistic infections. So the main interest of the study was uh, patients were getting uh, different type of immunosuppression. So we wanted to find um, whether they are getting, uh, so the earlier part they had just the predaza so alone as a combination, so that's the non-CNI group. Uh, then, um, then cyclosporin came. Some people were getting a combination of predaza and cyclosporin CNI. Then the later very small group, when the study like 2002, it started. They added the predaza CSA, cyclosporin plus mycophenolate mofetil. So we wanted to comp compare the number of infection, how it came. Uh, so what? The uh, Kai and uh, Schubel did is they added a marginal mean and rate model, but now incorporating a subscript for each type of infection, simultaneously assessing it in a joint model. Okay, so the rate function now you can think in terms of if you're thinking it's a, like a stratified model. Uh, so each uh, each uh, infection or each type of event, what you are, if you're modeling, will have their own rate. So that allows, it's an extension from the proportional rate model. And uh, by, you can fit this, uh, like this was fitted using these variables. And you can see the results, basically you can see the, this is again, in the beta coefficients, you can interpret it. It looked like more, the PRED as a MMF are more likely to have more type so the, uh, more infections, okay? This is, we are assuming this model, in this model, what we assumed is uh, the rate of infections between uh, uh, bacterial, viral, and fungal are pretty much the same. So we assumed that the immunosuppression will have same infection, but you can, you can again, provide an opportunity to give like uh, you can, further expand this, you can have a coefficient for uh, immunosuppression for uh, type specific immunosuppression coefficients as well. So the example, the model what we fit is basically gave you assuming that the rates are pretty much the same, okay? So it is an example and this gives you for a control group how each one, so this is under, since we forced everything you can see there is a, on an average uh, for in months, like over 150 months, this is over 10 years, uh, the number of uh, recurrences for bacterial is um, a little bit smaller, but the viral is much more higher because there were a lot of CMV and mycosis was also very low. You can see the number of recurrences uh, on, the, on the scale. So, so that's an extension. Uh, one further extension uh, I would like to talk and then I'll take questions is like um, sometimes you involve not just one level, okay? One level of uh, 
what you call a, a clustering. So you can think that repeated events within a person as a cluster, but there are there could be situations where you can have uh, multiple levels of clustering. So uh, this topic is clustered recurrent events. Uh, basically, uh, you are thinking in terms of you have repeated events within a person, but that person is clustered within uh, certain groups. That clustering could be family, like um, you can involve individuals within a family who are correlated. Um, a childhood asthma study where children from same neighborhood may share certain risks. So children getting asthma attack is the recurrent events. The event of interest is asthma attack, but children from uh, some community could be treated as a cluster, okay? You can also have situations if you are involved in multi-center uh, trials, uh, you, can, you can treat uh, patients within a center that so the centers as a cluster um, uh, and they are correlated, so you need to adjust them, okay? So the motivation for this type of study is like, uh, this is published by Kai and Shubal. Kai is my, uh, uh, like Kai was my um, thesis advisor. She has developed a lot in this area, um, Jinman, uh, basically. And uh, renal transplant, uh, in renal plant, transplant, uh, the motivation problem for this paper came because it involved a multi-center trial. The main interest is morbidity experience among those renal transplant patients. How often these patients go to go and get hospitalized? when they are alive, okay? So the objective was to readily interpretable defined outcome. We wanted to like basically to control the healthcare cost. When they get hospitalized, uh, hospitalized the insurance has to pay. It involves a lot of cost. It involves a lot of the quality of life goes for those patients. So we need to see what, what impacts. Why are these patients going and getting hospitalized? So, uh, contrast of interest uh, it is put up is like uh, whether waiting time, somebody getting a transplantation, do they get uh, hospitalized more or if somebody on a dialysis getting? So that's the exposure of interest. That's why we put contrast. Uh, even within the transplantation, if somebody getting a live donor, uh, cadaveric donor or expanded criteria, post-graph failure, so that has been ex expanded. Okay, so the study involved for this one was uh, U.S. patients uh, who are on wait list for kidney transplant between 99, like in, in the year 99, which included like uh, almost 16,000 patients. Observation period and the follow-up included like around three years, like 99 to 2002. Um, patient began like uh, the starting point here is uh, initial wait listing, uh, and they were followed until earliest of death, uh, last to follow up or conclusion of the observation period. So that's the observation period is December 2002. Um, clustering happens uh, within the center, I mentioned that. So the patients are clustered uh, by listing center. Um, why clustering is important is like, uh, because each center is different. They can be like uh, people going to a particular center may be common, correlated based on baseline health, disease severity, how they go, what is the availability, what type of insurance they have, all these things. So this study had 240 clusters, okay? The average uh, cluster size was, uh, the mean cluster size was 65. So 65 patients went to one center. A median was 46. A minimum was three and maximum was 644. Okay, so you can see some are small centers, some are big centers, you can see. Okay. You can say uh, of the 15,788, uh, about 53% are transplanted. That's the exposure of interest, okay? So, but uh, they have to wait for uh, average of 15 months to get transplanted. So it's the average wait time. In this, we didn't, uh, they didn't uh, basically 
consider that as death as an informative censoring, they consider it as censoring, just, okay? So you can say, so the main objective for that study was to compare hospitalization rates among those failures and uh, compare hospitalization for the kidney transplants. Also, they wanted to assess the impact of GRAT failure on hospitalization. So already I, I will skip this slide. Again, this one, okay, they proposed two set of rate functions. Uh, one is uh, cluster specific functions. They can include a cluster specific, they, they can include a subscript here. But here for the presentation, I just took a common, uh, common rate function for all the clusters. Okay, so adjustment was done. Okay, so the exposure of interest was three levels. One is waitlisting, uh, functioning transplant and the graft failure. Okay, so that's the exposure of interest like on which cri criteria you have different, uh, like uh, what impacts the hospital re repeated recurrent uh, hospitalization. Okay. Uh, for this model, what they did is the transplantation and graft failure were fitted as time-dependent covariates. That means if somebody, somebody on a follow-up, so they have to wait until this is a wait period. This is the waiting period. They get somebody get a transplant, okay? Then they can have a, they can have a functioning graft or a non-functioning graft. So you can uh, functioning graft, non-functioning graft, uh, you, you can have then how many hospitalization they had. So it's time dependent in where they fall in and they can also split. So that's how they fit the model. So you can see here the model involved, the assumption is like uh, they assume death as a non-informative censoring. Um, so, and they threw in the variables. Basically, the kidney transplant, KT stands for kidney transplant, GF stands for um, uh, the graft failure. I'm sorry, somebody. So basically, they split it and um, you can see the uh, hospitalization rate ratio. So I'm just uh, showing you in this talk, I'm not there are different rate function models allowed for different scenarios. And uh, you can see the, uh, the clustered, it takes care of clustered recurrent events and you can use them. Um, summary, so I just want to summarize whatever I presented here. One is, is people commonly use uh, Anderson Gill model. Uh, they are very good models and it has been well established models. Uh, but uh, the issue is like uh, in these mo modeling a recurrent rate model and choosing the model depends on many factors. So it, it depends on uh, number of events, recurrent events, uh, relationship between the subsequent events, how much risk. Having one fall impacts the second fall. Having one infection, their risk changes. Uh, the effects uh does the effects vary across the recurrences the biological process um the dependent structure all these uh matters in selecting the choice of the model okay so if you think about um uh the anderson gill model basically uh what it does is basically uh it is used um there are several comparisons uh, and um, discussions have done, uh, usually Anderson Gill model is used when the interest is overall recurrence rate. It's not type specific. So you cannot choose it for all scenarios. Similarly, it has been recommended uh, when very small proportion of your subject has greater than two events, then Anderson Gill model is good. If you have a lot of people having repeated events like medication filling, or recurrent falls, then Anderson Gill model may not be a suitable model. Similarly, uh, if you look at it like uh, stratified models, like a total time model, PWT model, PWP model, um, are used when there are few recurrent events. Okay, 
uh, because if you have eight, 10, then PWP models are stratified proportional intensity model, then you will, you will end up with small risk sets. The interpretation becomes a problem. So how do you interpret, you say, when within uh, two events, you have a higher risk, but when it goes to four events, it has smaller risk. There is no justification. Logically, it will be a problem. Uh, so proportional rate models are really good and interpretation wise, and it's easy to fit. Um, uh, and you can, there are models which has been uh, developed to handle informative censoring, uh, clustered recurrent events, uh, multiple type recurrent events. So I thought this would be a in good introduction uh, overview. But again, I, I need to mention it that uh, there are, this is just the tip of iceberg. There are different other models like transformation models, non-parametric models, uh, recurrent event models under uh, interval sensoring framework or a Bayesian framework. I've not even just talked about, okay? So there are many, uh, models available. Um, I think um, uh, according to your research criteria, you should check it out uh, and choose the right models that is uh, appropriate for your research data. So I would like to acknowledge because some of this data and involvement, Dr. Josh, Josh T. John, he used to be at CMC Velour, right, uh, now at Royal Brisbane Hospital. Sue Blaylock uh, and Jinwen uh, our, um, uh, Sue was a colleague uh, at the UNC uh, Chapel Hill. Jinwen was my um, mentor and um, academic advisor and um, not um, thesis advisor. And uh, I need to acknowledge them for the, uh, like some of the data is what I've showed. Uh, I put some references here. Uh, I'll, I'll send it to Dr. J. Seelan and the team, um, if, if somebody wants to, you can um, get this uh, references. So I'll stop here and uh, thank you for the opportunity and I'll take uh, questions if you have time, so. Uh, any questions, uh, can you please um, ask us or please put, the, put your question in the chat box. Now you can unmute yourself and talk to us about your questions. Can I ask a question, just a stinky? Sure, yes, please. Uh, thank you, Shankar, for that presentation. So comprehensive. My question is, how do you make a choice between a mean rate model and a conditional model? I don't. I'm not sure whether you spoke about it. If so, I've missed it. Sorry. Uh, rate models are so. The conditional models, the Anderson Gill model, I think I presented before, in a sense, like. Conditional models are good. They are based on uh, extended Poisson on a renewal uh, processes. Um, uh, they, they are not marginal. So not usually the marginal models are recommended when you are not explicitly modeling a correlation structure. That's what we do under uh, under survival analysis. None of these involves a direct mo modeling of correlation structure for the recurrent events. So we adjust them using, so they are, conditional models are not that suitable. So to start with, like anderson Gill model or a PWP model. Um, so on the other hand, the rate models are better and interpretation wise. So I would, say that rate models are better in two ways to use. So then you can, once you have chosen a rate, then you select what, depending upon the problem. Um, the other issues also I mentioned about uh, Anderson Gill model is it's restricted for certain situations. Uh, like kind of, if you have overall recurrence rate, if your problem involves multiple type of events, you are not interested in uh, just uh, one type of event, then Anderson Gill model is not suitable, right? And um, Anderson Gill model, I also mentioned that it's recommended when you have small number of uh, events with more than two events. 
small small number of participants if you have more people having then that's not going to help so you you have eventually you have to look in terms of a rate model than a conditional model if i answer your question i don't know so yeah i got some idea to read up further uh, mm -hmm. so just one clarification so if we assume that the uh, the variability uh, uh, between individuals is kind of no, sorry between events are kind of uniform would it be better to go for a mean rate model because there we are not even considering the variability isn't it because it's an average can you repeat that question? So for recurrent events within an individual, if mm -hmm. we assume that uh, the variability of, of re recurrent events mm -hmm. uh, are kind of similar, equal variance of you recurrent events uniform. between, yeah, more, more or less uniform. I, I'm just trying to understand because you're again coming back to the an average when you're doing a rate model so what would be going back to the question what would be a condition where that would be a preferred model over a conditional model i think i think uh, that's an excellent question like uh, even in the uh, even even in the uh, um, just give me uh, oops sorry uh, even in the even 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 in the uh, uh, even in the uh, Anderson Bill model, um, it, it you assume some sort of uniformity in the uh, in the events, um, and you get your the variability is adjusted through. Uh, the robust variance we are not conditioning on certain things right like uh, you need to make some sort of assumptions if i'm answering your question okay. like basically okay. even in the anderson bill model or uh, uh, the um, valen weisfeld uh, marginal hazard model uh, yes the events occur you are assuming they are to be uniform you're expecting it to be uniform it's not going to be there are some models people have developed uh, for varying, varying, uh, incorporating variability, but uh, practically, that's it's a little bit. That I don't think there are softwares to handle that. Okay, so. thank you, uh, Shankar. Um, for a given data, uh, mm -hmm. is there any simple way to diagnose? to see that I should go for this model. Uh, uh, say, um, <laughs> say for an example that uh, we have looked at a rate models, conditional models, and uh, the concept of clustering. Um, then there are frailty models and so on. Uh, the, I, 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 I remember the frailty models and uh, the clustering are the, are they nearly similar or a totally different one? Uh, they they are different basically. Oh, okay. In frailty models, um, we I didn't even mention frailty models. Uh, frailty mm -hmm. models, you are explicitly modeling the variability, right? Mm -hmm. So here you don't uh, uh, you are just using a robust variance to adjust for the clustering. So mm -hmm. yeah. so again, that's a different type of frailty, uh, the conditional model. Okay. So the ones here, uh, the conditional model, what we are saying, conditioning on the history, uh, yeah. then the frailty are just estimating the variability directly. So they, they are conditional models, but they are different. So, so for an example, that uh, the frailty means that I have the weakness to get the next event, uh, so something like that. So therefore, uh, if you look at it, that. Um, uh, for a given structure that uh, what kind of, uh, do you measure that uh, the frailty component in each uh, the data and uh, try to do that one. As we go for, um, as we know more models, like uh, you start from the endogenic model to 
uh, clustering model and frailty models and so on, that the assumptions and uh, the conditions are becoming uh, complicated. Uh, the, the, the not com com uh, conditions, uh, the rules or the, uh, or the guidelines to use a model becomes uh, complicated. So is there any sort of an example that, uh, so is, is there any, like what we do is that this is a situation I use the simple model, Cox pH model uh, and stratified Cox pH model and so on and so forth. That is there any simple way when you have a recurrent even models, looking at the data and try to decide. Uh, uh, okay, so, so if I like, so uh, I, this is what I do. So maybe different people yeah. use different uh, uh, thing. So I like to use the rate model. I directly go a semi-parametric rate model because I know that it's easy interpretation doesn't uh, delve on a lot of uh, strong assumptions. So mm -hmm. then I choose uh, uh, then I choose the type of uh, events like what I'm doing. If my interest is uh, among the among the ones I, the rate model, so among the uh, what the designs call for. If I have a clustering like a multi-center study and I want to adjust, then I use the clustered uh, rate model. If I have, so if I wanted to handle uh, uh, terminal events, basically if that's an informative sensoring, then I use uh, uh, info, uh, inverse probability sensoring weighting involved. So I go by that. My simple criteria is like um, choose a rate model, uh then I use it in certain scenarios i've used uh, frailty models but um uh, uh, uh the investigator if they are interested uh, in estimating the variabilities and uh, getting the estimates so that that's the scenario i i've kept a, a decision tool so there is no one simple way to do it and again some of these models do not have like Again, you want to go, you want a parametric um, uh, frailty model, shared frailty models. Um, uh, so which one to use? Again, it gets complicated, depends upon the research criteria, but I personally try to keep it simpler and uh, mm -hmm. and go, go from there. That is, you are saying that you start with the rate models and then- Rate models, yeah. Mm -hmm. Given it's the interpretation is easy and it can, mm -hmm. it, the, it, it overcomes a lot of uh, criticisms other models have. So mm -hmm. like uh, you don't have to have a smaller number. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a smaller number of stratas. You don't mm -hmm. have to do a lot of other things. So it overcomes a lot of deficiencies other models have. So globally, what is acceptable you choose and from there you, I, I move on. So that's how I treat it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I think I saw some question on the chat. Is there a okay. role for sub hazard distribution uh, model or transitions? Uh, multi state models normally uh, involve these uh, type of uh, multi uh, transition state models. Uh, uh, transition models, mm -hmm. sub bar hazards, especially uh, like normally people use it under competing risks situation. Uh, competing. Uh, uh, competing risk. Uh, uh, so, uh, so that's that's when uh, people have developed recurrent rate models under competing risk scenarios. Uh, there are excellent books, book chapters. They discuss about this. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, I would I would refer you to look at there. So, under competing risk. Uh, Terminal event, you can look at it in terms of a in, in terms of a competing risk problem, uh, but uh, people have dealt with competing uh, other other uh, other problems as well. There are different other pro uh, models have been developed for informative censoring. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. If you don't have uh, questions, uh, we'll wind up here. There's an excellent okay. lecture, uh, uh, Shankar, that uh, 
uh, we are really uh, refreshed and sensitized to newer areas yes uh, and um, uh, thanks for inviting me yeah, yeah. thanks shankar thank you